Okay, I think we should probably just make a start and um, people can just, just join in as they as they get in. So thank you everyone for joining us at our bonus expert seminar on monkeypox. We're really excited to have everyone here with us today. Um, if you're working in healthcare or otherwise, you all probably know monkeypox has kind of taken the world by storm recently, and everyone's going bananas over it. So we want to kind of demystify monkeypox for everyone uh, involved in treating patients with it or seeing it. Um, it's been around in the uh, in in Africa since the 70s, um, but it, it's quite new to us in in the global West. Um, so we've got a fabulous panel of speakers here for you today. In terms of structure, what we're going to do is just get each speaker to uh, give a little talk for at least around 10 to 15 minutes. Um, at the end, we'll do a, a panel Q&A. So you can submit your questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So without further ado, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Fola Cole Adiefe. She's a consultant physician, dermatologist, and venereologist at the Department of Internal Medicine of the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital in Ikeja. She's actively involved in clinical research on various areas of dermatology, including albinism, skin biophysical parameters in darker skin, acne vulgaris, atopic dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, and dermatological infectious diseases such as leprosy, scabies, and monkeypox. Um, she is also a creative arts enthusiast, uh, a professionally trained dancer, and runs a social enterprise that promotes health and well-being using the creative arts and technology called AYUNA. I hope I pronounced that correctly, the AYUNA group. Um, so, um, Dr. Cole Adiefe, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Monty, for that um, introduction. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is um, Fola Cole Adefe. Um, permit me to share my screen, please. Thank you. Right. So I'm going to be... I'm going to be um, starting this um, bonus seminar on monkeypox with um, an overview, clinical presentation, and management of monkeypox in Nigeria. So this is my outline. Um, I'll just go through that briefly. So monkeypox, as we know, is a re-emerging infectious disease caused by the monkeypox virus, which is a DNA um, virus. And um, it's the same family as cowpox and smallpox, which are both viral zoonosis, meaning they are transmitted from animals. But of course, uh, monkeypox is less severe than smallpox. It was first discovered in monkeys in a research lab in Denmark in 1958, hence the name. It's actually not really related to monkeys. They were just unfortunate to be the first animals that you know monkeypox was discovered in. And then the first human reported case was in Congo in 1970, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Since then, it's occurred mainly in Central West Africa with few sporadic um, exportations, I would say, until 2022 when it became a global infectious disease. And there are two clades or types of monkeypox, um, the West African clade, which causes a milder clinical disease, and the Congo blazing clade, which is more severe. So between 1970 and 2021, there have been several thousand human cases of monkeypox in about 11 African countries. And there was an outbreak in the US in 2003, but in the last 20 years, the number of cases has exponentially increased, like a 20-fold increase. And this is thought to be due to the waning immunity that we have from the smallpox vaccine, which was discontinued globally in 1980. And so a lot of people alive today do not have immunity against smallpox. And that is also may also be causing um, a resurgence of monkeypox or be contributing to it. There was a re-emergence in 2017 in Nigeria after about 39 years of no cases of monkeypox. And between 2017 and 2021, we've had a lot of quite a few cases with sporadic um, cases, outbreaks in Singapore, Israel, the United States, Cameroon, and other countries in Africa. 
So this is just um, a slide showing the Congo Basin and the West African clade. As you can see, the Congo Basin clade is quite predominant in the Democratic Republic of Congo with over 26,000 cases in the last 12 years. However, in on the other side, there are a few other countries surrounding the DRC, like the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Republic of Congo, which have had a handful of cases in this period. But on this other side, the West African clade has very few cases um, to, in comparison. However, Nigeria has had 276 cases in the last 12 years, more specifically in the last five. And Cameroon and Liberia and Sierra Leone have also had a handful of cases. There may be some under-reporting here as well, but this is these are confirmed cases. These are the numbers for confirmed cases. And the West African clade is common in young adults, as opposed to the Congo Basin that's more in adolescents and children. They are both more common in males, but the case fatality is much higher in the Congo Basin clay than the West African clay. Now this slide, sorry, is a bit um, full, but I would just want to point, this is the Nigerian experience. So in the last five years, we've had 267 suspected cases, 674 confirmed. This year alone, there have been 41 cases and one death. And we find that you have more in the age range of people who have not been vaccinated against smallpox between 11 and 40. And for some reason, it's much more common in males than in females. We are not sure why that is so. Lagos, where I live, has had the most cases in the last three years, although the outbreak was initially in the southern part of the country, south-south. But Lagos, which is in the southwest, in the last two years have kind of had more cases than, um, and this year has had the most cases so far. Um, now, this is talking about the international outbreak, which as of the 22nd of June, there were about 3,413 cases in about 50 countries, most in non-endemic countries from all over the world. And um, it's quite interesting because it's never been, there have never been this many cases all over the world you know, until this year. And we see mostly that it's the West African clade and the index case is said to have been from Nigeria. And this is a graph showing how the daily case rate is increasing gradually or almost exponentially with time. And this is, you know, quite concerning. So the transmission of monkeypox is, you know, via animal to human and human to human um, transmission. The natural reservoir, the animal reservoir is not really clear. It's not really, we're not really sure what it is, but it has been found to be in several rodents, the Gambian rat, some African squirrels, and then also in some smaller um, primates, monkeys. And the roots of entry are infected animal body fluids, blood and secretion, skin rashes, intradermal inoculation, from scratches and bites during hunting and the consumption or handling of inadequately processed meat you know, from infected animals, what in this part of the world we refer to as bush meat. Now in the human to human transmission, it occurs with close contact with, from the broken skin, mucous membranes, sexual contact, which is also close contact and direct or indirect contact with body fluids, also from fomites like linen, in hospitals and all, and the sexual con um, contact aspect, we're not sure, we think it's more skin to skin, but there are new studies showing there could be in semen as well. I'm sure we'll hear about that from our other speakers. And then the hospital acquired um, infections have occurred quite frequently in health workers who are, who are treating um, or, or have treated monkeypox cases. So the clinical presentation Typically what we see, there is an incubation period of about five to 21 days after exposure to the animal or human that's infected, followed by an, a prodromal period of headaches, fever, you know, myalgia, malaise, and then the skin eruptions occur within one to three days of that prodrome. Now the skin eruptions typically appear on the face first, and in 95% of cases, they have facial lesions followed by the extremities, the palms and the soles of, uh, and then, then the trunk, also in the genitalia. And patients typically have quite a number of lesions ranging from between 50 and 200. Then the rash evolves over 10 to 14 days. You sometimes start as macules, then morphs into vesicles. Sometimes from vesicles, 
um, from the onset and then becomes pustula, a vesicular pustula rash, which has crossed, uh, which can then cross over, sometimes become ulcerated. Now, the presence of lymphadenopathy is said to be a key symptom which can clinically distinguish monkeypox from varicella zoster or chickenpox, which is also quite common and endemic. And the rash usually lasts about 10 to 14 days, but can be longer in certain instances. This table shows the frequency of lesions seen in the outbreak in Nigeria between 2017 and 2018. And you find the rash in all cases, then fever, headaches, pruritus, lymphadenopathy, chills or sweats, myalgia, and other symptoms as well. So these are um, pictures of patients with monkeypox managed in Lagos, Nigeria. You can see that there are multiple umbilicated vesiculopustular lesions on the face. And you see that there are various varying um, densities. Some have you know, a few and some are quite extensive like that. So these are um, some, this is the typical presentation that we see with monkeypox cases. This is a, um, this is a slide of a Caucasian patient seen in Lagos with monkeypox in December, 2021, with the classical umbilicated um, vesiculopustular lesions, which you know, we have. And then he also had some genital lesions um, with crusting and also some, some also on the palms and soles. Now these are genital lesions associated with monkeypox. They're not actually so rare in patients that we have seen. A lot of patients actually presented with genital lesions. And these are the umbilicated and um, pustular lesions or vesicular pustular lesions in, on the scrotum, this on the mons pubis, and that was an ulceration on the um, penile shaft. So these are typical, um, presentations of genital lesions in monkeypox cases here. And this is monkeypox with immunosuppression. Um, this patient, this first patient had um, an organ transplant, a kidney transplant and was on immunosuppressives and, and then contracted monkeypox. Unfortunately, he succumbed to the illness. This is a, this second and third slide, the patients with retroviral disease, HIV positive with very low CD4 count presenting with very exaggerated and severe um, clinical presentation of monkeypox. Um, he was on admission for four months. Luckily, he was able to survive the um, infection. And this is another patient with HIV positive with very low CD4 count, less than 100. And um, you can see that the monkeypox lesions tend to be much larger and more exaggerated with immunosuppression like retroviral disease and tend to be more crusted and ulcerated. You can see that there's secondary, secondary bacterial infection in this patient. That's why they're kind of greenish and that's probably um, what the cause of um, the demise of the patient. This patient did not survive. So diagnosis of monkeypox can you know, look similar. I mean, diagnosis has to be different, differentiated from chickenpox. So a clinical um, diagnosis alone is not, um, is not satisfactory. One must you know, send the samples for PCR. So we do polymerase chain reaction to confirm a diagnosis of monkeypox. And a confirmed case is a case with all the clinical features plus a confirmatory PCR diagnosis. Um, for the investigations, we take samples from two areas, two separate lesions, um, a deroofed lesion so we can get um, to the viral fluid and have that sent, you know, for PCR. And in some cases, also serum IgM antibodies are done, particularly if we're, if we're trying to do surveillance and if the patient no longer has lesions or the lesions are dried up. But there may be some cross reactivity there. So PCR is the gold standard of preferred laboratory choice. And then in some cases, a skin biopsy can be done when other um, differential diagnoses are con being considered. This includes chickenpox, as we know, varicella zoster, molluscum, contagiosum, um, disseminated herpes, syphilis, um, disseminated histoplasmosis, impetigo in children, um, postular scabies, um, hand, foot, and mouth disease, coxa, coxa, disease and 
these are some of the differentials that sometimes need to be considered. Now for treatment, monkeypox is very is mainly self-limiting, is mild in most cases, and the treatment that we um, have been very um, familiar with is more of supportive therapy. So hydration, antiemetics, antioxidants, mucosal care where there is mucosal involvement is also essential. And a cyclovir and its derivatives have been found not to be effective, but we gave them anyway because we had nothing to lose. And we're not sure if they did have any benefit, but the studies all say they offer no benefit in monkeypox. Antibiotics were um, necessary in many cases for secondary bacterial infection. So we used quinolones and clindamycins, which have good soft tissue um, penetration and we also use a lot of oral antioxidants, vitamin C and zinc to help with healing. Um, the newer broad spectrum antivirals like brisindofovir and tecovirumat are not readily available in Nigeria and we don't have any, I don't have any experience using them, but I'm looking forward to hearing from others with the use of these medications. The vaccinia immune globulin we hear is also being considered for severe cases of monkeypox and with immunocompromised patients. However, what we do and um, practice is isolation either at home or in hospital facilities, depending on the clinical severity of the disease. And barrier nursing with strict infection prevention control measures is very essential and must be instituted until the lesions dry up because this, they, they are infectious until they, they scab over. And of course, contact tracing, surveillance, and isolation of co close contacts is essential to prevent transmission. Now, the, the vaccine is known to be preventive 85%. A newer vaccine is now available, um, not for us yet, but hopefully so. And this you know, can be a game changer with um, breaking um, the chain of transmission and controlling the outbreak. Now, most patients in our country have mild clinical disease and the lesions actually are mainly epidermal in most cases and heal with minimal or no scarring, except in immunocompromised patients. And the case fatality in Nigeria is about between three and 4%. Um, it's very usually RVD patients, then one child, and of course, immunocompromised patients who have had transplants. It's also said to be more severe in children and pregnant women. Now, the, new, the, the current outbreak in non-endemic countries is quite concerning. And, you know, as of today, I think it's almost at 5,000 and is still, you know, rising. And these are countries, about 53 non-endemic countries currently involved and with what are the reasons possibly a super spreader event and we find that you know the reports are most cases are men who have sex with men and there are unusually high rates of human to human transmission and some people are, are suggesting they may have been undetected circulating um, monkeypox in the communities I'm not sure if that's really possible and it wouldn't have been detected but that's a school of thought. And then the clinical presentations are said to be atypical um, in non-endemic countries. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about that with no prodrome, with fewer lesions, solitary genital lesions only, and then sometimes mucosal only. And we're not sure what's driving the difference, but it could be due to climate, could be genetic variability and differences in immune function. Now, these are some of the factors, this is my last slide, contributing to um, the resurgence of monkeypox. We think the waning smallpox herd immunity and then population surge in endemic countries, in encroachment into animal habitats, climate change, sanitation challenges, and poor health seeking behavior can be some of the driving factors. And then in non-endemic countries, we're thinking of migration and frequent traveling, social behavior and possible super spreader events, then sometimes maybe inadequate surveillance or contact tracing, particularly when you're, you're not in contact with the people you're transmitted to. And then people are just wary of isolation because of the COVID pandemic. So it's difficult to get people to isolate. Um, so thank you so much. I'm looking forward to hearing more from my colleagues here about their experience with monkeypox. I'm looking forward to learning from them as well. These are my references. 
Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to, you know, appreciate the patients who managed to give permission for their photos to be used, and my colleagues in Lagos who also co-managed some of the patients that, you know, the photographs were presented. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole Adeife. That was remarkable. And certainly some of the photographs that you shared, oh my gosh, um, so interesting. I mean, I already have so many questions, but we have the panel discussion at the end. So we'll save the questions for that. Um, I think um, that gives us a very smooth transition onto our next speaker who I'm delighted to introduce. Um, one of my ex-bosses and also uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Nicolo Girometti. He is a consultant physician in HIV and sexual health at 5016th Street in Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, UK. He obtained his specialist degree in infectious diseases and HIV from and HIV medicine at Bologna University in Italy. He has a research interest in HIV prevention strategies and aging in people living with HIV. And he's been managing a lot of the patients um, at in uh, 5016 Street in London who've come in with monkeypox. So over to you, Dr. Giromessi. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Do you see the slides? Yes, thank you. Yes, perfect. Uh, thank you for having me. This is this is brilliant, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Koladefe for her presentation because it's a, an excellent uh, uh, wealth of information to compare to what we are actually seeing uh, uh, in London at the moment. I can talk about what we're seeing at 5016 Street is a very large uh, uh, sexual health clinic in the heart of London, and uh, we've been seeing a whole lot of monkeypox cases so far. We're definitely not looking forward to the next few weeks after Pride this weekend, but uh, um, I'll show you what uh, we're seeing so far. Um, I'll break at a glance. Uh, 3,400 confirmed cases up to the 22nd of June, mostly identified in the WHO European uh, regions. Uh, as Dr. Kola Deifa said, uh, so far, since the uh, outbreak started in uh, the 14th, uh, on the 14th of May, there has been just one death, and the remaining cases are scattered across uh, uh, the remaining countries in the globe. Um, what happens in the UK? Um, on the same date, um, 23rd of June, UK HSA has launched their second debrief uh, with some more information, 910 confirmed cases. The overwhelming majority of them were in England and actually more than 50% were in London, where we had 590 confirmed cases. Uh, from a, a demographic point of view, 99% are male patients, 96% are gay, bisexual and other men having sex with men with a median age of 36 years, so a fairly young cohort. Uh, one in four patients is living with HIV, 54% had a uh, an STI confirmed in the previous year, and one in three had traveled 21 day, within 21 days from the previous, uh, from the, the symptoms onset. So is a young, very uh, mobile population of uh, um, gay men. Um, what are we seeing at Chelsea Westminster Hospital? Uh, since the very first case, which has been isolated in, on the 14th of May, uh, we've seen a rising trend of uh, uh, people presenting with potential monkeypox infections, getting tested for monkeypox infection and going forth to have a positive test for monkeypox. We do test uh, using a PCR uh, swab that we send to the um, uh, lab that uh, is in the south of England. There's one lab run by UK health security agencies called Ripple. We had 291 confirmed cases, which are actually 10% of the cases globally. So they came through our sexual health clinics. Um, so it's quite remarkable. And we always need to consider the impact of such a volume of patients and the impact that the management of these patients has on the delivery of a sexual health uh, service and seeing patients. Um, who is testing positive though uh, at this uh, time? 99%, uh, this, this is a, um, basically a course of 54 patients, patients that were tested positive for monkeypox in the first uh, three weeks. 
since the start of the um, uh, outbreak in London. 99% were gay and bisexual men having sex with men, uh, with a similar median age than what reported by Public Health England. 70% were of white ethnicity, 48% UK born, matching pretty much the, the demographics of those who are normally attending a sexual health clinic, uh, uh, our sexual health clinics in London. 46% traveled outside the UK, namely uh, many of them traveled to mainland Spain, islands in Spain, uh, but also France, the Netherlands, Italy, uh, the United States. No one traveled to um, Nigeria, Congo, or other countries where uh, the circulation of monkeypox um, um, was known to be endemic. One in four uh, are people living with HIV. Differently from what reported in previous outbreaks in other countries, in particular Nigeria and Congo DRC, uh, all these patients were on effective antiretroviral therapy. 85% were undetectable. The remaining 15% had just started antiretroviral therapy because they were just diagnosed with HIV. They all had a CD4 count greater than 500, so uh, perfectly immunocompetent. The remaining part, the HIV negative individuals, uh, when 95% of them were on PrEP. Um, due to the similarities of presentation and uh, the fact that we need to take into account the, uh, in the differential diagnosis process other sexually transmitted infections such as syphilis and herpes, but also uh, molluscum contagiosum, uh, we tested in particular at the beginning uh, these lesions for, uh, with a multiplex PCR swab testing um, with a PCR for herpes and syphilis and Haemophilus ducrae. Interestingly, no one tested positive for syphilis on the PCR test. Only one had a positive test for PCR. Only one of these 54 patients was also tested for varicella zoster virus, and the result came back as negative. One in four tested positive for a concomitant test PI, though, uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis via serology. Uh, these uh, speaks quite uh, a volume about how uh, in which context this infection uh, is transmitted. 9% require hospitalization, uh, mostly due to uh, the need for analgesia, pain relief, uh, laxatives, um, care of the oral mucosa or uh, allowing patients to swallow better, in particular when they had ulcerations in their uh, pharynx, uh, but also for antibiotic treatment, uh, uh, to address bacterial superinfection. What we are seeing is that a small number of patients are presenting multiple lesions, particularly on the perianal skin, where they tend to uh, become uh, vesicular postular, coalesce, uh, leading to widespread ulceration. Obviously, that part of skin is always uh, quite moist, uh, prone to infections. There are super infections uh, and uh, um, actually um, constipation and uh, 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 these patients are taken into the hospital. The median time of hospital stay for these patients was of seven days. They all uh, went home after seven days and they're all fine. Uh, in terms of symptoms that we found, and this is a very interesting uh, comparison to what has been described in previous outbreaks, but probably I speculate here, uh, transmission of monkeypox was slightly different and uh, probably viral loads carried were also different. We see a lot less of the features, classic features of the invasive phase of monkeypox. Two out of three patients reported fatigue, asthenia or lethargy. Uh, just about more than one in two reported fever. Usually these symptoms, fatigue, asthenia, lethargy, fever are very short lived, just a few days and they disappear. Um, myalgia, uh, muscular pain has been reported in 30% of cases, sore throat 20% of cases, but the most important feature to me is the absence of prodromal symptoms reported in one of, in five of these individuals um, who are actually presenting at our sexual health clinics with uh, uh, the, the hallmarks of the eruptive phase, so skin lesions. And in here, I have to differentiate between rash and uh, skin lesions, because some of these patients, 11%, are presenting with macular papillar rashes or eczematous rashes, um, inflammatory type of skin rashes that are 
not syphilis, and uh, they are associated probably with monkeypox on top of the classic skin lesions that are vesicles, postules, and then uh, the progression into ulcerations or scabs. The overwhelming majority of them, 89%, presented with more than one skin lesion. 94% presented either with genital or perianal lesions. And there is a, a, a trend matching the type of sexual activity they had with the localization of uh, um, the, um, the lesions, uh, probably signifying that skin-to-skin -skin contact is actually the way uh, that you know these um, uh, monkeypox is transmitted. 72% uh, had lesions only on one or two anatomical sites, which is also very different than what reported before. We don't see the 95% of lesions on the face. Actually, we see um, uh, just one in five individuals presenting with facial lesions. Half of them present with lesions on their limbs. Uh, and uh, uh, a small number have uh, lesions on their torso, uh, but uh, frequent symptoms is actually lymphadenopathy on their groin mostly with lymph nodes that are also very often uh, quite uh, remarkably swollen. Um, interestingly, besides these 45 cases, now we have 291. So I was able to carry out a little bit more of uh, digging of symptoms. Uh, we had three patients so far who had proctitis. Uh, they were presenting with proctitis, uh, severe rectal pain, some bleeding, constipation. They had no other symptoms. They had no skin lesions. Uh, and uh, we did an, a PCR test uh, through proctoscopy, and that came back positive for monkeypox, probably signifying that there is a possibility for uh, transmission of monkeypox during sexual intercourse, but this needs to be demonstrated and uh, you know, proven with further evidence. So just to um, uh, basically um, show what the difference is we found so far in our cohort of patients, one in five did not report prodromal symptoms, only 57% reported fever, lymphadenopathy, mainly at the groin, uh, less skin lesions on face, neck, limbs, predominance of lesions localized on the genitalia, multiple lesions with variable morphology, mostly distributed on one or two sides. So we see patients that are presenting with vesicles and pustules. Some of the lesions are scabbed. Uh, it really depends by which lesions have started to appear first. And then there's a progression in that sense and high rates of concomitant STIs. So let's never forget to test these patients for STIs as well. Um, just a bit of a quiz for the audience, because uh, they may have never seen uh, monkeypox uh, as it is presenting in, uh, you know, uh, in London at the moment. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to try and guess uh, which one of these two is monkeypox. Only one is monkeypox. I'll keep it short anyway. So for those uh, who are just thinking about it, I'll show what the right answer is, is the one on the right. This is a gentleman who presented only with these two lesions and no prodromal symptoms. Uh, and uh, we swabbed him and he presented, and that was monkeypox. The one on the left is molluscum contagiosum. And here instead, which one would it be? I'll allow just 10 seconds to guess. They present similarly. It is a presentation that we see in sexual health clinics. Just one is monkeypox and is the one on the right. Um, the one on the left is condylomata lata and presentations. Uh, well, they're not condylomata lata actually. They're uh, just uh, lesions compatible with secondary syphilis. Uh, these are the presentations that we've seen so far. Some of the pictures, I really thank patients for allowing me to use these pictures. I just wanted to highlight the first picture, uh, number two. Uh, these lesions have coalesced, causing a large ulceration that superated, super infected, required uh, antibiotic treatment. We have a very low threshold to use oral antibiotics. Um, um, generally, amoxicillin is our go to, or uh, flucloxicillin is our go to uh, antibiotic. And uh, number four, these perianal lesions actually coalesced together uh, 10 days after they resulted in this large ulceration, which has been 
um, um, these as required hospitalization. The patient was constipated and needed antibiotic treatment uh, and uh, cleaning of the wounds anyway. And the patient now is perfectly fine and uh, there's no scars remaining. With this, uh, this is my last slide. So I want to thank all my colleagues uh, that have been bearing and uh, carrying the weight of uh, seeing all these patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Giromati. That is fascinating. And um, I think it just it reminds us to, you know, in, in today we, we must keep monkeypox is like the new HSV. We just need to keep it at the top of our differentials. I think so anyway. Um, also, I have to say, you mentioned that the first case at Dean Street was diagnosed on the 14th of May. And I think I may have been the one to, to see that patient. So anyway. We, Maybe. I'm not we, quite sure. I need to go back. We, we, we move on. We move on. Thank you so much. Um, also, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. We'll address them at the end uh, at, uh, at the Q&A. So moving swiftly on, um, I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Emily Shaw now. Um, Dr. Shaw qualified at the University of Cambridge and University College London Medical Schools and is now in her final weeks of training in infectious diseases at the Hospital of Tropical Diseases and the University College London Hospital, as well as postgraduate studies and lecturing at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Shaw was awarded a UCL Welcome Clinical Fellowship and undertook her PhD in BCG Vaccinology. She has a substantial experience caring for high consequence of infectious diseases in high level isolation units and has spent periods overseas, including working with MSF in a multi drug resistance TB program in Uzbekistan. At the Hospital of Tropical Diseases, she has co led uh, on establishing their monkeypox service and a monkeypox virtual ward and has contributed towards UK national guidance. So over to you, Dr. Shaw, tell us about your virtual ward and other stuff. I think you might be muted. So uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I uh, <laughs> failed to unmute myself. Uh, so let me just see if I can get this to work. Uh, so we're gonna go. Right, can everyone hear me and see my slides? Yes, I'll speak Fantastic. For Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's such an honour to be invited um, to present today alongside some really esteemed speakers and some uh, such high calibre of talks so far. Um, so I, I hope I can uh, maintain the standard. Um, and so as, as was introduced, so um, I'm an infectious diseases doctor um, at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and I've just checked on Google Maps, we are one mile up the road from 56 Dean Street. Um, so our experience um, is, is very, very similar to, to what was uh, described on the previous uh, talk. Um, and I'm going to focus on my talk, I was going to talk about the epidemiology, but I think the previous talk covered that really beautifully. So I'll just um, pass over that slides, but I'll talk about how we're managing it. Um, um, from a hospitalization point of view, uh, talking about how we risk stratify our patients, um, how we're managing them. And I'll also introduce our virtual ward, which we've been en enrolling the majority of our patients on. I'll touch on treatment for severe disease, and then I'll talk about our lessons that we've learned so far at the HTV. <clears throat> um, so yeah, um, the majority of our patients will come to us, either they'll walk into the emergency department at UCLH, or they'll come to our walk-in clinic uh, at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. And then we'll also receive referrals from uh, general practitioners in the community um, or sexual health clinics where um, this uh, patient may be presenting with more systemic symptoms um, or, or thought to be more unwell. So not appropriate for a sort of community, community uh, sexual health clinic. Um, so that's how they come to us. And um, our criteria for um, seeing someone and suspecting, calling them a probable case, will be that they have an unexplained rash. And um, our criteria was that they also had to have um, a, 
also a systemic symptom such as fever, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, back pain, and lymphadenopathy. And we are seeing that, but as Nicola touched on, we are seeing about a fifth of our patients don't have systemic symptoms um, or the systemic symptoms might um, follow and, and come after the, the lesions appear. Um, and then they have to have a risk factor, either that they've had uh, contact with a confirmed case of monkeypox in the 21 days prior to onset of symptoms or travel to West or Central Africa in the 21 days preceding onset of symptoms or um, be a man that has sex with men. Um, or we also say anyone with sort of high clinical suspicion. But I have to say we have seen uh, we have been reviewing cases where there is a high clinical suspicion. But as of yet, um, because at some point there will be overspill into other communities. But as of yet, none of those patients that we've seen where there's been a high index of suspicion but haven't had a risk factor, none of those have come back positive for monkeypox yet. And in the vast majority, it's been VZV um, chickenpox um, presenting in an adult. Um, so either the emergency department will will see these cases and ask them to see us uh, for us to see them or they'll come in from the community. Um, so we'll ask that if patients are well enough from the community that they make their own way to hospital, uh, that they wear a surgical face mask and that the lesions are covered and ideally they walk if able um, and if they're too unwell uh, to make their own way then um, uh, then our special ambulance, the HART ambulance, uh, uh, which is able to manage high consequence infectious diseases, will be summoned. Um, and then we assess them. Uh, so as you'd expect, we're asking for the systemic symptoms and then we ask for the history of the rash. Uh, and we're also taking um, a risk factor history um, and then we'll examine them. And this is predominantly um, uh, focusing on the lesions and where they are and also examining for lymphadenopathy. Um, so if they meet the criteria and we, uh, we believe that this could be monkeypox, then we, we send uh, tests to the rare imported pathogen laboratory, which is based in Porton Down in South, uh, South England. So at the moment, that's the only laboratory in our country uh, which is able to do any PCR testing. And as you can imagine, they, they've been absolutely hammered uh, with samples. So they... Um, are trying to roll out testing to local laboratories, but a challenge for them has been that there's, there's not been a sort of off the shelf, uh, commercially available PCR test for the laboratories. Um, so hopefully by July, um, hospitals will be able to, uh, virology departments will be able to perform their, their own PCRs, which should take the pressure off um, the uh, reference laboratory and should also hopefully expedite us being able to get results and simplify the system. So if we see someone who just has maybe isolated lesions in one area, so just genital lesions and doesn't have a disseminated rash or uh, systemic symptoms, then we'll just send two skin swabs in viral media for PCR. Um, but if they have a disseminated rash, um, or systemic symptoms as well, then we'll also send a throat swab uh, for monkeypox PCR and an EDTA. Um, and then we're also seeing um, contacts of confirmed cases who are presenting with systemic symptoms such as fever uh, and myalgia, who we suspect might be having a prodrome, who, but who haven't yet had lesions yet. So in those, we're sending a throat swab for PCR, but with the caveat that if that was to come back negative, we sort of keep them then, we enroll them on our virtual ward and keep them under close observation so that if um, that PCR was then to come back negative, but they go on to have an eruption of lesions that sounds suspicious of a monkeypox, then we bring them back and we retest them again. Um, and as has already been tested, touched on, so when we first started seeing these patients, we weren't doing full SDI screens. Uh, I think there was a reluctance to have additional samples moving around the laboratories um, and sort of increasing the risk of um, um, uh, laboratory exposure to samples and also as infectious diseases uh, doctors we really sort of didn't feel 
uh, maybe qualified or that that was our role and uh, to do STI screening and the plan was to then refer them to local GU clinics um, if appropriate but actually we really had to modify our actions and do a lot of learning uh, and and it, it is appropriate we're seeing a lot of um, concomitant um, sort of syphilis or gonorrhea uh, and given that these patients often are then uh, in the majority of cases are isolating at home it wouldn't be appropriate to leave them with untreated other infections so we're offering full STI screening uh, with the, the uh, sort of telephone support from our GU colleagues to guide us. Fine. So um, once we've seen patients and we've assessed them and we've taken the sampling, um, in the majority of cases, we're then trying to get them home as soon as possible. So this is to get them out of the emergency department where we've always obviously got clinical vulnerable groups who are around um, and um, because they're often very, very well and don't need to, uh, to be admitted for clinical reasons. And then also so psychologically, um, a lot of patients prefer, especially having gone um, uh, through through sort of COVID isolation, the prospect of then um, having to isolate in hospital um, is a bit overwhelming for some. So wherever possible, we're trying to get them home. Um, and um, so uh, we then sort of risk stratify them to see whether that would be safe. So patients either uh, uh, meet the criteria to be in group A, group B or group C. So where they're group A, uh, we consider them to have severe disease with their probable monkeypox. So this is either if they're presenting as a sort of SERSI septic uh, type picture, or we think that they're immunocompromised, so at risk of getting severe monkeypox. And that, uh, uh, has been has been touched on in the previous call, uh, lecture. So well treated HIV, uh, you know, with a good CD4 count and suppressed viral load for us doesn't count as immunocompromised. Um, we haven't seen any pregnant patients yet, or if they've got really uh, disseminated lesions, or there's a secondary sepsis, or they've got any other complications, uh, then we'd call them a group A, and then they would meet the criteria for admission. Um, or if they're a group B, this is because they're not able to go home and safely isolate. Um, so either they um, uh, are of no fixed abode, which we have seen, or sofa surfing, or sort of living in a sort of hostile type environment, or they um, live with children or people who would be considered immunocompromised. Um, and then we call them a group B and consider whether they need admission for, for those reasons. But far and away, we really try and avoid bringing people into hospital because um, obviously we've got over a thousand cases in the UK now and our high consequence infectious disease beds are a scant resource. Um, so if it's the fact that they live in a, in a one bed apartment with their partner, uh, then whenever possible, we're asking their partner to, to um, relocate to a hotel or to go and stay with friends for the duration of our patient's isolation. Um, but the majority of patients we're seeing are what we call group C, so they're low risk, so they've neither got severe disease and they're able to isolate safely at home. And in that case, then we discharge them from the emergency department and enroll them onto our virtual ward. Um, so we'll ask them to make their way home, covering all the lesions, wearing a surgical face mask, walking wherever possible. And then we give them our, our telephone number so that they can call us if there's any concern or they, they need to get in contact. And we give them our email address so that they can email us photos of their lesions uh, so we can begin the ongoing process of monitoring them in the community. So this slightly complicated slide is a sort of flow diagram of our virtual ward. So as I touched on, so we'll see the patient in ED or walk in and we'll test them and then we'll go and I will ask them to go home and isolate and we'll stay in regular phone co communication as we enroll them on our virtual ward. So in the majority of cases, we get the re PCR result uh, within about 48 hours. Um, and if it's negative, we'll ring them up and see how their symptoms have evolved so if we've got a high suspicion hang on this really you know it was our, our, our highest suspicion that this was monkeypox rather than uh, an, an alternative differential or they've had an evolution of symptoms or more lesions then we'll bring them 
back in and we'll retest them again. And so far we've had two cases uh, where initial swabs um, were PCR negative and then they've subsequently come back as um, positive from the lead. So swabs from lesions have initially come back as negative, but we had a high in index of suspicion. So we retest them and they've come back positive. And in a handful, they've either had the prodrome or had had close contact and uh, lesions that were probably actually acne or something like that. And we've tested them, they've been negative, but then they subsequently Subsequently, gone on to get suspicious lesions. So we brought them back and tested them and they come back positive. Um, if our index of suspicion was low or an alternative um, test has come back positive, uh, then for example, they come back VZV positive or HSV positive, then uh, we'll instigate appropriate treatment and discharge them for our virtual ward. Um, but in the majority of cases, we've got a pretty high hit rate. Most, most that we see are more than often than not, they're coming back up positive. So in which case we um, will reassess them to see if they still meet uh, the category C, um, the group C criteria that they're safe to isolate at home. And if there's any uh, concern that that's not the case, then we can always bring them back in to reassess to see if, if they've deteriorated with their disease. Um, if um, they are C, then they'll continue to isolate at home and then we'll follow them up with regular phone calls. Um, and obviously if they're A or B, then, then we will arrange appropriate uh, admission to hospital. Um, initially, when we were seeing probable cases, we were notifying all of them to the Health Protection Agency, but both that was clobbering us and clobbering them because of the sheer volume of cases. So now we are notifying Health Protection Agency of confirmed cases, not probable cases. And they'll go on to do all the contact tracing and um, also um, for close contacts of confirmed cases, they're now able to direct them towards post-exposure prophylaxis, smallpox vaccination. Um, initially, we were calling everyone sort of every 48 hours to follow them up on our virtual ward, uh, but we were finding that that wasn't necessary in the majority of cases that people were very well and isolating safely at home. And it was also overwhelming us because we we're quite a limited resource as an infectious disease team. I, I, I am the virtual ward on most days and we'll have about 50 patients enrolled on our virtual ward every day. So it was just not sustainable to call people every 48 hours and in some cases is we, we, we sort of go by um, uh, uh, how they are clinically and how their mood is, how they're psychologically coping with isolation, what their needs are. If we've got any concerns, uh, then we can call them uh, more frequently, but some patients were able to de-escalate it to uh, once or twice a week. Um, and then, so it's dealing with complications in the community. Uh, so it's already been, has been touched on. We do worry about secondary um, infections and that's probably the, the highest complication, the most common complication that we've seen. And we're able to courier uh, medications out to people where necessary. So um, we can um, uh, get uh, antibiotics to them by the end of the day, or if um, any of their STI screen also comes back positive, uh, we're either able to carry out antibiotics or where required bring them back to the emergency department for a shot of intravenous ketraxone to, to cover for gonorrhea um, and also analgesia uh, and other symptomatic relief we're able to send out. Um, so I'm just going to touch on treatment. So as I as I talked about, we 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 offer symptomatic relief, and um, I'm sure our colleagues in Nigeria have far more experience uh, than us with this. And we've sort of been leaning on on their CDC guidelines to 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 learn from how to best manage these lesions. Um, for the systemic symptoms, we've just been recommending regular paracetamol. We really emphasise to patients to try and keep their lesions clean and to avoid um, touching them too much or Lots of people are trying all sorts of home remedies and creams and lotions and potions that they found in the med, um, in the bathroom um, cabinet that they're they're putting on, and, and we are finding that that can seems to precipitate impetigo and secondary cellulitis. So we're trying to avoid um, the lesions being interfered with, giving them regular analgesia. We have found that patients with um, the proctitis and perianal lesions and also tonsillitis are really suffering with pain. Um, for the genital ulcers, we've been giving um, low Local anesthetic gels, so the um, the lignocaine gels that people might be familiar with, um, 
used for when catheters are being inserted and they put instill a gel down the urethra beforehand. We've been giving that to patients to put uh, apply topically to their um, lesions. Uh, we have a low threshold for, for giving antibiotics and for oral lesions, uh, we've been using Diflam spray, which is like a local anesthetic, I believe, um, that, that patients can apply topically to their oral lesions. And we haven't actually had any complications of conjunctivitis yet. Um, and then there's the antivirals. So um, um, uh, uh, antivirals that um, are, have been licensed for use against smallpox are sidofovir and uh, uh, brinsidofovir. We don't have any access to those medications, so I have no experience of that. Um, the UK has a very small supply of uh, uh, tecoviramat. Um, so we are we have a limited access to that, and it has been reserved for patients who are thought to be more unwell. Uh, so anyone from the Group A category that requires hospitalisation, then we we seek um, to to prescribe uh, tecoviramat uh, for them. Whether it's uh, clinically efficacious or not uh, is unclear, and uh, studies are just um, being rolled out. So uh, prior to this current outbreak, uh, there was an N equals one um, experience of tecoviramat in the UK, which had been published. So there was a recent Lancet um, uh, case um, series for imported cases of monkeypox prior to this current outbreak. And they'd used tecoviramat in that patient and his um, uh, PCR detection had uh, rapidly um, sort of um, diffused, but whether that was, um, so, so the, the, the um, instinct is that hopefully that was the tecoviramat that, um, that was um, making him undetectable, but whether, whether that um, is going to to play out in larger <clears throat> larger clinical trials is is yet to be seen. Fine. So our patients stay at home under regular uh, uh, virtual. Um, observation and then we guide them as to when they're able to end their isolation at home so they have they have they're asked for, uh, from us to stay within their bedrooms if they um, live with other people ideally have their own uh, bathroom if they're to leave their bedroom then to put on a surgical face mask and cover the lesions um, with a plaster or clothing um, to spray down any surfaces that they've had contact with such as the toilet or taps um, with an alcohol-based cleaning product and spend as little time in communal areas as possible and if they're going to share uh, rooms with their flatmates um, that their flatmate also wears um, uh, a face mask that they keep a meter distance and that the, the windows are open and then um, we say that they're able to end their self-isolation so they're pretty much able to go back to normal life if they've had no new lesions in the last 48 hours no oral lesions uh, are remaining that all those have healed that all their lesions have crusted over and then for the exposed skin such as on the face or arms or hands that the scabs have then also dropped off and there's new re-epithelialization underneath and then for the non-exposed skin those lesions have to have scabbed over uh, and be covered if the patient's to leave the house and that during that pit first um, stage one uh, ending of self-isolation period they're not to have any contact with people who are immunosuppressed pregnant or children even if that means they can't go back to work and then about normally it's about 72 hours after that patients meet the criteria for stage two full de-isolation de which is where all their lesions have crossed over the scabs have dropped off and they've got intact skin um, uh, that's um uh, come out from underneath um, and at the moment it's the recommendation from uh, UK HSA is that once they then met all that criteria and that they're able to de-isolate that they still we ask that they use condoms for eight weeks after when resuming sexual activity um, because there is a suspicion that it, it may still be transmissible by semen um, but that's an ongoing um, area of investigation so we may that that might be modified um, in the coming weeks. Um, so um, I, I was just going to quickly touch on a bit of our data. Um, so um, in our first month, which was we enrolled our first, we saw our first patient on the, oh, our first patient came back PCR positive on the 14th of um, May. So from there for one month thereafter, 
we had 50 positive patients enrolled on our virtual ward. 60% um, of those had either walked into us uh, from ED or our walking clinic. Uh, and then the rest had been referred by other sites or sexual health clinics who um, wanted us to manage them now that the patients had been confirmed positive. The vast majority, so 76%, uh, 38 of those 50 remain group C throughout the duration of their, um, their um, illness. Um, so they never required any uh, hospital admission and they were managed exclusively as outpatients. And then um, for the rest that required admission, um, uh, the reasons are given below. Uh, so for a couple, it was just because they were the very first patients that we saw. So we hadn't set up our virtual ward. Uh, we had patient with dysphagia, someone who had reactive joint effusions in three joints, so wasn't able to mobilize and was quite set, sort of septic looking with that. Uh, one patient was admitted because he had um, uh, diarrhea and vomiting, which was found to be norovirus and also went into urinary retention with um, probably due to one of his um, uh, urethral uh, ulcers. Uh, and then we've had to ad admit three patients um, because of secondary cellulitis, but the majority we've been able to manage with oral antibiotics in the community. And one patient had an MSSA bacteremia and three patients weren't able to be at home because they were either of no fixed abode or sort of sofa surfing. Um, so they didn't have somewhere to safely isolate. Um, and so this is the duration of how long patients have had to isolate at home between the onset of their first symptom uh, until we've been able, <coughs> excuse me, to de-isolate them. So the range has been 10 days to about 30 days. And as you can see, we've had really, really good adherence and, and cooperation from our patient group. Only three patients um, from those 50 um, uh, so were sort of lost to follow up and disengage with our services, either after they tested positive or after we'd let them know about their positive result. So where we're at is that uh, my belief, our belief is that monkeypox is here to stay in the UK now and it's becoming an endemic. But at the moment, we're currently only seeing it within um, the MSM community. We've had amazing um, engagement with the services from our patients. A few have declined to get tested when we've seen them all then go on to isolate or, or disengage from our services. But the vast, vast majority have worked really well with us and done everything that we've asked of them. Uh, we asked that a lot of patients cope well with the isolation and just sort of keep busy and work from home, but we are seeing the psychological impact in a handful of patients um, and some have really suffered with anxiety. Um, it's been a struggle because our, our national guidelines have been changing at some points, you know, sort of almost on a daily basis. So trying to keep up with that to make sure that what we're our, our standard operating procedure is in keeping with the national guidelines has been a struggle. Um, we're seeing a high rate of positive positivity. So where we have a high clinical suspicion, um, there's a high, high rate of the test coming back positive. Um, as is the experience um, at Dean Street, we are seeing patients who um, either don't have systemic symptoms and just have localized lesions or their systemic symptoms don't precede their lesions. We're seeing very few complications. The majority can be safely ma uh, managed in the community. Unfortunately, we are seeing a poor uptake of post-exposure um, uh, uh, prophylaxis uh, vaccination with a smallpox uh, vaccine that is being offered to community contacts and healthcare workers. More people than not are taking up the vaccine. And as of yet, all our cases that we've seen, I think we're about 80 now, have had quite a clear history of um, uh, what's suspicious for um, uh, uh, acquiring their monkey pots through a sexual contact. So I think all our cases have, have um, reported um, uh, to having casual partners within the three weeks prior to onset of symptoms. Um, and I just want to thank all my colleagues um, at uh, the Hospital for Tropical Diseases and UCLH uh, and our colleagues in um, sexual health and at the laboratories and uh, Porton um, Port and Down that have been doing all the testing and Public Health England and the High Consequence Infectious Disease uh, Network, uh, who everyone is working incredibly hard at the moment. So thank you to all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean, oh, <laughs> you know, triaging patients and treating them on the phone and monitoring that. I mean, it's 
certainly it does not sound easy at all. So uh, very well done and very impressive. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, I Thank think you. Um, you, you mentioned about the anxiety and I, uh, and uh, I think that, you know, swiftly moves us on to our next speaker really well, because certainly, you know, even especially after COVID, and then also given that the population that we're seeing this in, in the MSM population and the anxiety related to HIV, et cetera, I think that's probably a huge burden that we're, we're, we're maybe, uh, you know, not addressing so much, but will come to light in the next couple of months, maybe. Anyway, um, Dr. Shakarat Gold Olufadi uh, is our next speaker. She is a consultant physician, dermatologist, and genitourinary medicine specialist at the University College Hospital in Ibadan, Nigeria. Um, she had an interest in procedural dermatology and this afforded her the opportunity to get hands-on mentoring scholarship in dermatologic surgery through the International Society of Dermatology in Brazil under the tutelage of Dr. Luiz Castro, a prominent surgeon in Sao Paulo. She's particularly passionate about health education and advocacy and her online dermatology teaching through her social media pages uh, can be accessed on her website, www.skinandall.com, which is a wide reach to both the public and healthcare professionals. And she will be talking us about the stigma associated with monkeypox and what we as healthcare providers and outreach workers can do to, to try and prevent the spread. So over to you, Dr. Gold Olufadi. Hi, um, thank you, Monty. I'm trying to, I want to do that split screen thing. How do I get to do that? Sorry, I'm not so tech savvy. <laughs> I, I think you're doing it, but to be honest, oh, I'm not either. So I think the it's way worth it. The picture was showing on the right side and the other way. Okay, let me just go ahead with my presentation. Good. It should happen automatically. Yeah, you should be good. Okay, great. Thank you. You know, one thing about being the last presenter, you have the opportunity of taking bits from here, bits from, I shouldn't even have done any slides because I would have just taken bits of information from here and there and just put it all up in the presentation. So I'm really happy to be here this evening, evening in Nigeria here. And um, it has been interesting listening to everybody talk. And I like the part I was given. It's about the social aspect, the global prevention strategies. And so we're gonna be talking about uh, dealing with stigma associated with monkeypox global prevention strategies and role of healthcare workers, you know, in um, preventing, um, um, in role of healthcare workers in, in the uh, monkeypox outbreak. So I'll just be following this outline, um, just uh, along the lines of um, what I'm presenting today. So, you know, generally skin diseases come with a lot of stigmatization and it's not surprising, you know, the skin is the largest organ in the body. And, you know, I make a joke often, I tell patients that come to the clinic sometimes, they come to skin clinic and they're like, doctor, how come you know what is wrong with me even without doing any tests? And I say, that's the, that's the jazz that dermatologists have. So um, skin diseases come with a lot of stigmatization, especially here in Nigeria. We have something that um, I call it the gaining function of the of one syndrome where people don't, they don't really mind. We don't mind. We like to poke our noses into other people's business. So if you see people with skin diseases, people are all out there, even in dermatology clinics, you have them being isolated by the patients. So you come with a skin complaint and other patients are there. And because you think one is greater than the other, you are kind of, don't move near that guy. Can you see what he has? So it is really bad here in Nigeria. So it's not surprising because of its visibility. And what are some of the contributors? Inadequate knowledge. Again, a lot of people read so many different things on the internet. And so they, they gather all the different kinds of knowledge and they don't have the correct knowledge. Dramatic presentation of information. And this is quite common these days. You know, I think the dopamine that comes with sharing information, I'm the first to share this information. So people just dramatize things. So again, another thing again is blame sharing. That's, you know, those are some of the factors that are responsible for stigmatization associated with monkeypox. And from the former speakers, you'll see that especially out there um, in, the, in, the, in the developed countries in the West, what you have is that you have more of uh, monkeypox cases being diagnosed in gay and bisexual men. Probably the reason why we are not, you know, really diagnosing that here is because, you know, in Nigeria, same-sex relationships, is, they're still not allowed kind of in the public out there. So when we see patients, you know, same-sex relationship patients, bisexual patients, even when they come to the clinic, sometimes it takes, you know, gentle probing and all that for you to determine the sexuality of your patient. So 
some of our patients in Nigeria may actually be bisexual, but you may not be able to get that information from them. So it's important to emphasize that cases can, you know, you can get monkeypox can be forgotten by anyone, even though more cases have been documented in gay and bisexual men. And it is important to emphasize that it is a global disease, not just about sexuality. Because if you remember the AIDS, um, um, the stigmatization I shared with AIDS in the 90s and the 80s, and that was how it all started initially, focusing on sexuality. And what will happen with this is that it will prevent patients from presenting in good time, and that would increase transmission. Um, Falake mentioned something about, oh, she doesn't think that um, patients would have such lesions and they won't come to the hospital. But I've seen a lot of patients here, the average time that people present, especially with um, long-standing skin diseases in Nigeria, they take their time. They might have skin conditions for about two years before they present, and that's because they will try so many different things before coming to the hospital. So I can assure you that some of the cases of monkeypox are out there hiding in the community here in Nigeria. So care must be taken not to feel sexuality and monkeypox as, as, as one. So as I mentioned before, I had documentation of cases in gay and bisexual men. This may be because of the networks, you know, amongst their groups and awareness about sexual health. There is small community and they network a lot. So because of that, there may be a higher documentation and reporting of cases in them. And if you look at a lot of cases that were presented, most of those cases, they are, you know, mild, mild cases to moderate cases, not like some of the severe cases that for can be presented. So, you know, but over there, maybe the health seeking behavior of gay and bisexual men is, you know, is, is more. So what are some of the role of healthcare workers in curbing the stigma associated with this, this um, monkeypox, monkeypox? The most important, I think, is to provide information in clear, concise, and simple language without dramatization. Recently, I am very active on social media, even though I take a lot of breaks, which I'm on one currently, I have had to call colleagues to order, you know, because, you know, I think there's a dopamine that comes and it, health workers, we are not immune to it, that comes when you are sharing information, oh, this is this, or do you know, I saw something being shared by a colleague once and I had to call the person to order that this is wrong information you are sharing in a bid to share information, to be popular out there, because the dopamine that is associated with um, you know, being all out there, because doctors are, we have doctors on social media now that have up to 1 million. I have colleagues that have up to 1 million followers, 2 million followers. They tweet one thing, and you have 10,000 of people retweeting that same thing. So it's important to be able to provide clear, concise, and simple information without dramatization use of all available communication channels. It's especially important in areas like ours. You know, focusing on social media alone is not going to do the work. You want to use radio, television, print media, social media, all forms of media, acting, billboards, everything you can find to pass the information across. Because um, here in Nigeria or here where we have in Africa, where we have the more severe cases, if you do not pass the information across properly, what you are going to get is that before they come to the hospital or before they present, they would have tried everything possible from herbal concussions to um, triple action creams. And we know using steroids on you know, areas where you have viral infections, that can, be, you know, that can be disastrous. So they would have tried everything. And patients tend to trust their healthcare workers. So if you are sharing that information, you are laying their fears and you are sharing it in simple language that they can understand. Using indigenous languages, I'm currently doing a study now where I'm doing something on indigenous languages for some certain conditions. Using indigenous languages to share such information would help in, um, in, in, in reducing the stigma. Disseminating information widely by organizations and partners involved in management and identification of cases. A lot of the information I have on this slide are some of the things that I thought of, put together as a physician and, um, and somebody that treats sexually transmitted infections. And I also got them from the Center for Disease Control, the WHO website. So um, going back to the role of healthcare workers now, a good way to debunk myths and give correct information. I, I don't know why I'm really focusing on social media. 
And that's because not just patients alone, a lot of doctors, patients, even people that you will not know that, that, that are using smartphones now. A lot of people are using smartphones from, and if you look at the age group affected by monkeypox, that young age group, they use smartphones a lot. So you can use funny ways to present this information without making it look scary. And at the same time, you are presenting correct information. Um, I have a doctor here in Nigeria. His name is Apoko Doctor. I think they know him, not just in Nigeria, everywhere. So a lot of organizations, they are using you know, his platform to share information and to share correct information. And so it's important to use our devices, use every channel um, available to disseminate information. And another thing that is important is that healthcare workers generally, you need to bring out information such as the symptoms and the signs associated with monkeypox, what to do when a close contact has monkeypox, it's important to educate about the low pathogenicity of the, of the virus and the possible modes of transmission. Because in Nigeria, if you say that it is tri or sexual transmission is something that the first thing is that if a patient has it, it will bring out the list of his girlfriends or boy or a list of sexual partners. And the next thing is that you have information and people are sharing things all around. So it's important to educate them that it's not just about sexual contact, but that sexual contact can be a means of transmission because of the close contact during um, um, sexual, um, um, when you're having, uh, when during sexual um, contact. Okay, let me put it that way. Education about how sexual contact can be a means of transmission should be in sexual health clinics. Because now we can see that sexual contact is a major way of getting the condition because of close contact. And that we should tell them more that the concerns are more about the morbidity rather than mortality, because that would reassure them. And that the disease tends to be more in people that are immunocompromised. So it is important to present early to the hospital. It's also important to emphasize that the recent outbreak is just evolving and that news will continue to change as the, um, as the um, um, virus is being studied, as the clinical presentation is being studied. This one I want to talk about is about healthcare workers themselves. Discrimination sometimes from healthcare workers. I have been in a clinic or I've seen a particular healthcare worker. Sometimes patients come into the clinic, the skin lesions are so florid, and sometimes some of the patients or some of the healthcare workers are unable to hide their shock when they see some of the skin lesions. It is important to note that professionalism must be maintained while ensuring that empathy is incorporated into patient management. Of course, you need to protect yourself, universal safety precautions that are necessary with the use of appropriate personal protective equipment when handling suspected cases, proper environmental sanitation and waste management. So um, finally, I was, I was going to talk about for the role of healthcare workers, Dr. Shaw mentioned, mentioned something about the virtual clinics. Interestingly, during this COVID pandemic, you know, um, Virtual consultation was something that it was not really not really popular in Nigeria, but with COVID, a lot of dermatology cases or a lot of dermatology um, specialists now they are seeing patients virtually. I have seen a lot of patients virtually. Dr. Cole has done the same. So this is something that we can incorporate into management, especially in areas where uh, monkeypox is endemic, because not all patients have to come to the hospital. And again, if these virtual clinics are incorporated, our clinics, when you come to our specialty clinics in Nigeria, they are, you know, they're not so big. We have a lot of these patients. When they come, they are seated close together sometimes. So if you have virtual clinics, this might even help to curb the transmission of um, COVID-19. And I recall when I had, I had COVID then, when I had COVID then, this virtual thing was, I was diagnosed, they came to my house, they called me, they kept on calling, they kept on checking on me till I was well. And so even self-testing is being done now. So self-testing can also be incorporated into, um, um, into the diagnosis of um, monkeypox. So let's look at global healthcare prevention strategies. How, has, well, how can we you know, look at, how can we globally work on monkeypox to, to, prevent, um, um, you know, to prevent the disease from even becoming widespread than this? So the most important thing is to work with global partners to increase awareness and reduce stigmatization. So global partners, they will include partners locally in areas where they are affected and you know, all around the world. In Nigeria, for example, Nigerian Association of Dermatologists, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Infectious Diseases Unit, and you know, collaborating with Center for Disease Control and World Health Organization to increase awareness and reduce stigmatization. 
Again, strengthening the healthcare system and promoting collaborative research. Africa is where um, you have the most cases of monkeypox. That's where you have more severe cases. And it is important to collaborate. You know, um, I was looking at it that this present pandemic, even COVID, it wouldn't have been much of an issue if you know, it stayed just within the region where it was diagnosed. But it became an issue when it started crossing borders. So I don't think we should wait for diseases to cross borders because diseases, they won't tell you when they're about to open that door to cross borders. And we've seen that with the COVID pandemic, we've seen that um, isolating people or putting people in a place is not going to work for a long time. People want to travel, people want to mix together. So it's important to strengthen the healthcare system for areas that are most affected and promote collaborative research about monkeypox. Dissemination of accurate information through community leaders, groups, community healthcare workers. And another thing to do again, especially since it's been diagnosed more in um, the bisexual, the gay people, one thing to do again is to, they have a lot of communities, they have a lot of activities. So during months like Pride Month, you can share information, you can share a lot of, disseminate a lot of um, information during those kind of um, activities. Early surveillance and contact tracing, including travel history. I read that um, report about the uh, patient that was diagnosed. I had the one that came in from Nigeria to Texas, and I was so impressed about the contact tracing of that patient. And also the um, cases that were presented, that presented in UK in 2021. I really liked the way the contact tracing was done, the isolation and all that. So it is important that contact tracing, including travel history, should be done as quickly as possible. Risk assessment and stratification, and Dr. Shaw already highlighted a lot of that, and having standard operating procedures for clinics, for uh, you know, so that you don't have to, you have standard operating procedures, and it's universal. You have simple flowcharts and questionnaires to assist in screening for probable and high risk contacts, and what to do about um, um, for each case and individualize the management. Dispelling myths about vaccination. See, the COVID pandemic, looking at Nigeria, for example, the vaccination um, um, rate here is still less than 30% compared to a lot of other places. So with vaccine, you hear people telling they have come to give us something that will damage our blood, you know, a lot of myths around it. And so with this um, um, uh, monkeypox again, there's a lot of work to be done. If you really, if we really want people to take up the vaccination because we need to dispel the myths around vaccination. Support for provision of the vaccines and antivirals for resource poor settings. So, you know, when you were mentioning Tecubirimat, Bracidofover, I was smiling to myself because I, those drugs, I just see them. And I'm sure I, I probably will not, you know, see them physically for a long time. So it's important that the areas where, you know, that are most affected, those antivirals get to them. And now talking to the government in Nigeria too, we need to collaborate, not just depending on you know, um, supply of vaccines all the time. We need to also collaborate and ensure that we, we make sure that we are able to also sustain all this for ourselves. Taking advantage of notable events I've talked about, all that training of stakeholders involved about early recognition of monkeypox. In Nigeria, we still have we have still we still have less than 200 dermatologists or 300 dermatologists in a population of almost 200 million. So skin disease, you know what they tell me when they send me pictures? Oh, Dr. Gold, it's a rash. So a lot of people, when they see monkeypox in outpatient clinics or when they see, they are going to diagnose it as chickenpox. I am so certain of that. So it's important to train in, I'm talking about environments like ours. You need to train the people that are going to see um, um, the cases primarily first before they get to the dermatologist. Because if not, one case will present to the family medicine clinic, will be diagnosed as um, ch chicken pox or molluscum. Then the patient goes home, starts applying so many different things. And before you know it, it's widespread everywhere. So that's very important too. Then careful consideration. I, I, I saw the, um, the write-up you know, and a lot of buzz now about um, changing the name of monkeypox to something else. So right from the start, before naming diseases, we must have some careful consideration to avoid stigmatization. Then provision of fact sheets. People are going online, people are reading a lot now. So provision of fact sheets, patient-friendly sites, frequently answered questions. And for here in Nigeria, or for here in Africa, not everybody can read in, you know, but a lot of us, we speak English is our you know, primary language. So, um, 
if you're not doing English, if you're not doing indigenous languages, you can also do it in languages like we call, we call it pidgin English. That's like, we call it broken English. You can do um, your education in that particular language. And a lot of people more than, even people that didn't go to school can speak pidgin English here in Nigeria. So it's important to provide fact sheets and patient friendly sites with frequently answered questions. So finally, um, why is this particular outbreak getting a lot of attention? Because monkeypox has been here for a long time. It is getting a lot of attention because it is spreading to regions where it was not, you know, where it was not um, um, diagnosed um, normally. And those cases got there because of international travel. And let me tell you, people are going to go in and out. People are going to come into Nigeria. They will go out of Nigeria. So there's really nothing we can do. Today it is monkeypox. Tomorrow it's going to be some other exotic diseases. So when we we get a condition and it's coming, maybe it's in just one region, it's important to find ways to um, ensure that the spread, you know, is curbed on time. Because if not, it might be monkeypox today, tomorrow it's something else. So um, it's important to note that what affects a few would finally affect all because the world is increasingly becoming a global village and collaboration is important to ensure that the door is closed to monkeypox and all other exotic diseases that may be coming after. So just a few pictures, because Polake showed some pictures. I'm showing some pictures now, the faces of monkeypox. This was a patient that was managed by my colleague. The last case of monkeypox I managed was when I was still a resident doctor. I've not managed any presently in this outbreak. So these are some of the, you can see postules and all those um, um, lesions on the, on the patient. This patient was immunocompromised, and you can see that the rashes are more florid on this patient. If you're looking at this patient, this kind of patient without PCR, I'm sure the first thing that will probably come to mind is that this patient has secondary syphilis, you know, for this last patient on the right. But these are patients that, you know, presented with monkeypox and after PCR, the diagnosis was made. So I'd like to thank all the patients that gave their permission for their photographs to be used and my colleagues that were kind enough to send me these pictures. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold Olafadi. I think you really hit the nail on the head. You know, one of the reasons that our team wanted to have this, um, this seminar and invite uh, uh, people such as yourself and, and Dr. Cole Ariefe from Nigeria, including people from the UK and, and, and elsewhere in the West is because, you, like you said, monkeypox doesn't know any borders and uh, it's been around for ages. And actually we've learned this from COVID and we've learned this from monkeypox that, um, we really need to think about health equity and 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 learn from our colleagues who, who've who've been dealing with these cases um, for a long time and and we are all children of the world and things will spread. Um, so so thank you so much for for, for that really enlightening uh, summary of of what we can do to help our patients. Um, I I appreciate that we're um, a minute away from our target time, but. Um, if everyone's happy to stay, maybe we can just do 10 minutes for questions, but obviously no pressure to anyone if, if you have commitments or need to go. Um, thoughts? Can, the, can all the panelists unmute themselves, please? Fine, please. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Shakira, I think you need to stop sharing your slides so we can oh. see everyone's face. <laughs> Thank you. I have stopped that now. Thank you, Polake. All right. Great. Great. Um, uh, can I kick off the questions actually? And then I think we've got a lot of questions. Um, something that I'm, uh, you know, again, one of the things that we've learned here is that telemedicine is something that's going to probably change and is changing healthcare, certainly through COVID as well. Um, and we've seen a lot of different photographs from all of you of um, the way monkeypox presents. And I just wonder whether there's scope for um, uh, an image repository, like a global registry or image repository, and whether that will really help us as clinicians be able to identify the different patterns of monkeypox, because clearly it's a very heterogeneous disease. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it open to everyone to, to give us. Um, well, if I can just come in that certainly it's important to kind of have a registry and also, I think the WHO has something up now where you can report cases and kind of give some detail. So I think as clinicians, we should try to use that resource more. 
Um, incidentally, I managed quite a few patients kind of the way Dr. Shaw mentioned, like virtually, because after the first um, visit, every other communication with about three or four of them was virtual and they were just sending pictures because it was in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So yes, the virtual space is, you know, is very relevant in the management of um, monkeypox and other infectious diseases because it helps you to be able to control um, interactions and reduce the risk of cross infections and, you know, infections of other people. So yes, I think that's very relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got another question. Um, someone asks, are there any special considerations for monkeypox within the pediatric population that providers should be aware of? Um, Dr. Shaw, do you want to try that one? Oh, I figured you might come to me. I'm a friend, so I'm an adult uh, infectious diseases doctor. So we've got, um, uh, we're lucky enough to have a separate uh, pediatric infectious diseases team on site. So um, they uh, have been seeing the possible cases up until now, and um, we haven't, uh, thankfully, hadn't, haven't had any positive cases locally. Although we have had household contacts, which they're monitoring very closely. Sorry to, to not have more personal experience. No, I, that's fine. Um, I think so far there has been one children uh, who tested positive for monkeypox in the UK uh, since their recent outbreak. And uh, um, I think the concern is uh, coming from what has been previously reported in the outbreaks in the Congo and uh, Nigeria, where children were disproportionately affected in terms of severe outcomes than, than adults. Uh, so I think uh, the recommendation to, um, you know, uh, for patients who with positive monkeypox results to isolate and uh, to stay away from children under the age of 12 should stay. Um, but it doesn't look like there is an actual, at the moment, circulation of the virus in networks where children are present. But, you know, as we said, uh, this may happen, and so probably prevention is the better option now. Totally. Um, and, you know, kind of linked to that, I was reading somewhere, I think maybe it was the CDC or the WHO, that uh, there's a hypothesis that it may be aerosol transmitted as well. And certainly I was told that when I when I was in contact with monkeypox through a patient. Um, so I wonder, though, uh, you know, how in, in all of your experiences, how accurate is that? Do you think it's aerosol, you know, transmitted by respiratory droplets or aerosol transmission? Because doesn't I'm not convinced, but I mean, I'm not I'm not expert. So. Uh, I'm happy to, to go for that one. Yeah, uh, I think we're still um, we're still treating it as if it is. So we're still seeing um uh, definitely confirmed cases and wherever possible um where the clinicals there's a clinical suspicion the probable cases we're seeing wearing ff fit tested ffp3 masks um uh, it's not uh, clinically it sort of doesn't seem to be behaving as if it is aerosolized we have um i'm aware of a case where um, there was a patient who required non-invasive ventilation uh, before the team were aware that the, the, that the diagnosis was monkeypox and that case was aerosolized and there were 20 plus healthcare workers exposed um, without wearing um, uh, the, sort of what would be deemed the appropriate PPE and none of those healthcare workers uh, were infected. Um, and also anecdotally, I've got many colleagues who at the very beginning of the outbreak were seeing patients with disseminated lesions and oral lesions and were only um, either wearing not, a, not, not wearing a face mask or just wearing a, a simple surgical face mask. And there haven't been any, uh, thankfully, in this current outbreak, we haven't had any healthcare worker associated acquisition yet. So anecdotally, it all seems it seems to be skin to skin, contact, very intimate uh, skin to skin contact. Um, but at the moment, we, we still are treating as if it's airborne and wearing FFP3s yeah. until it's hopefully taken off the, the list of high consequence infectious diseases. And Thank you. That's, just yeah. to add something to that, and I don't know what Dr. Shaw thinks about uh, this, but it will be very interesting to find out from UKHSA when uh, the time comes. Uh, 
the analysis about the household contacts because uh, if you are a household contact who has sex with the patient with monkeypox, then you're likely to develop lesions and the monkeypox. If you're a household contact that has no skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact with a person uh, living with them, then you don't get the monkeypox. So that kind of uh, is a um, you know uh, is a strong signal against uh, uh, aerosol transmission. Uh, but just to give a little bit of a broader context, whenever we see patients with suspected monkeypox uh, who present with a cough or respiratory symptoms, then we upscale our uh, PPE wearing an FFP3 mask. That's because obviously uh, we cannot rule out that um, transmission via droplets or airborne transmission cannot happen, basically. So I, I think that's a very minimal layer of uh, you know, prevention that we can all adapt. Yeah. Um, and I think totally reasonable because COVID is still around. Um, yeah. So we've got another question. Is post-exposure prophylaxis recommended for those who've had close contact uh, with someone who's been infected with monkeypox? Maybe someone, one of the Nigerian doctors want to take that uh, because you've probably seen it for long longer. Um, well, not, not typically for people in Nigeria, what we do is more of contact tracing, isolation, and surveillance, basically. If you're very close contact with an infected patient, we ask the person to isolate for, you know, the 21-day period and then give feedback on whether you develop a fever or rashes. We do not have any post-exposure prophylaxis to give because that would either be the either vaccine or which is not available in this parts of the world. So basically we just do monitor the, um, the contacts with surveillance and you know they give feedback. Most cases, I would say close contacts do not develop um, monkeypox. The human-to-human -human transmission tends not to be so high. We usually see it in carers. For instance, if a child has monkeypox and the mother is caring and carrying the child, chances that mother would get it from the child or if a man has it and his wife is caring for him or vice versa and of course there, there there may be more close contact but in other cases usually there is no um human to human transmission and we think it may be more of animal to human in many of the cases that we see thank you i think dr <laughs> richmond has a question yeah just a quick follow-up question have you ever seen vertical transmission no, we haven't in um, Nigeria, we haven't seen, we've had a case of a pregnant woman who lost the pregnancy, but we haven't seen a patient, a female who had monkeypox and gave birth to a child with monkeypox, no. Hi, I, I was going to say something. It is raining heavily here, like I can hear my roof about to come off. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, Thank we you. can hear you. Um, so I was just going to comment that um, I think that Monty, just like you said, that um, droplet transmission, aerosol transmission, I'm not sure it plays a really big role, you know, but of course it's important to wear so PPE. And I think that yeah. the reason why we are getting it more in sexual contact is because of the close, you know, contact that you have during sexual activity. And if you look at even the patients that Folake presented and some of our patients, I think the immune status is also important because a lot of the patients that got monkeypox, most of the people that are around them, the only people that got you know, infected were people that were really close contacts. So like mother to child, like she said, husband and wife, but people that were just living together without coming in close contact, a lot of them didn't come down with the condition. So it's important to just emphasize that I think it's the it's more of the close contact that is um, um, increasing the um, um, transmission. And, and may I add the nosocomial um, infection with the fomite? So healthcare workers have to be really careful with things like beddings, clothing, and the surroundings of the patient because that those tend to be actually more infectious than the aerosol you know, or, you know, the droplet in, infection. If if care is not taken with those, uh, the linens, the, the, the bed sheets and things around the patient, there can be some transmission from that. 
Thank you so much. I think we've got one, maybe time for one or maybe two more questions, and then I think we'll probably have to wrap up. Um, we, we've we gotten a question from Zainab Baba. Uh, they asked, what could possibly explain why all patients in the UK centre presented have sexual contact, even though have contact with other people who didn't come down with the disease? Is it possible transmission is higher through semen than body contact alone? Um, I think we've kind of covered this, but um, I think Dr. Shaw, you mentioned something about transmission in semen, and I know there's been a paper recently by a group in Rome. So did you want to, or Dr. Giremetti, did you want to address this one? Well, what I can, what I can say is that, uh, that so far, it, you know, that what we've seen is that these patients had a huge number of uh, partners in the previous month. They're all highly sexually active. And although... Uh, my understanding from UK says that there's a drift towards less sexual partners in the pa in the patients that have been uh, uh, found positive recently. I don't know whether this is because the fear of monkeypox reducing the number of partners that you normally would have, or uh, if there is something else. But the fact that we fa we're finding patients with proctitis in absence of other symptoms and skin lesions, um, you know, uh, suggests. Uh, that uh, probably semen is uh, responsible for transmission of monkeypox. I guess we really need a study to prove that. I didn't read the study that you cited, Monty, so I'm not updated. <laughs> Honestly, it's very hard to keep up <laughs> uh, when the situation changes every day in the UK in particular. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I suspect that we will have that in that direction anyway. It's not unusual for a virus to be transmitted through semen anyway. Mm -hmm. Let me put it this way. Yeah. Dr. Shaw, did you want to add something to that or should we go on to the next? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, it's sort of early days um, in the UK from that perspective and, and certainly the UK HSA uh, are looking at that. And I know there is a study yeah. that started where they are asking for semen samples from patients uh, yeah. to monitor that. So we're we're being cautious at the moment and advising um, that to abstain from any sexual activity whilst you have uh, lesions that haven't re epithelialized and then used to, um, for condom use for eight weeks after as a precaution uh, until we've got more data on that. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, I think there have been some questions in the chat that have already been addressed. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we should probably wrap up, um, even though I could personally stay here another hour, but um, I'm sure people have places to go. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. This has been incredibly educational um, and uh, I'm sure the audience have uh, have thought so as well. And thank you also to the Global Dermatology Talks team who have worked very hard to make this uh, a reality. One last thing, Monty. Tell I me. wanted to ask, um, you know, you were just about to close. There's oh. something in Nigeria, we say item seven. Where's the food? Oh Where's my the menu? Goodness. Where's the food? <laughs> I have you to, to send keep us here for another hour. Where's the food? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's dinner time. Mm -hmm. Thank but you I so have much. Right. One thing before we close, you know, the elephant in the room, uh, uh, dating apps and, and Grindr and, and things like that, and even in places like Nigeria where uh, presumably, um, you know, as Dr. Gold Olafadi mentioned that, you know, sex between uh, uh, men is still stigmatized. Um, this is probably a huge way that it's being transmitted. So I, I mean, I'm sure there's some uh, outreach work going on in in these dating apps, but if not, I, I feel like this should really be a, a focus. Um, but anyway, we can have that discussion off. Definitely. Off. Um, Definitely. I really can't hear you so well. It's so, the rain is so heavy right now, you know. Yeah, I just can't rain hear you right here in Nigeria, it's pouring. Boring, boring. I'm really trying. Well, basically, we're just saying thank you so much and, and go enjoy your <laughs> evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to the audience as well for staying with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thank you so, so much, much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Good you.